But thank you, thank you for this, Shadi. We're so glad that I want to take the time. But join we, one more again, right here in this year land of the Gullah Geechee for zooming in upon sustainability. This year the Queen Quet, head upon the body of the Gullah Geechee Nation. So glad it, that I wanted to tune in for this year broadcast from the Gullah Geechee TV station. Well, look here, you know, no matter when we together together, especially when we the day of this year day, for find the healing space, we all make sure God presence the any place. And for this year, we take one time and thing like that. But make sure we honor them when we come for we. But make we who we be, that we be gotta get you and your people. So this your day, let we take a moment of silence, especially for all the big daddy mama them from back of Yona, who learn we, who we be, and who been the place that been that healing space. For plenty of we, let we take this year, moment of silence together before we start this year journey. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. We're so glad that the hundred children are tuning in one more again for zooming in upon sustainability and things like that. And so glad for had this your time for sit upon this your show, right here in the Gullah Geechee Nation. We'll start up Jacksonville, North Kakalaki, and going all the way down Jacksonville, Florida. Now, for the time we ancestors, the teeth from the motherland, and throw down young, but needs your sea island and thing like that, a red of us, and what they call the low country. Oh, everything ain't be easy. Not tall, tall. Have a deal with the Madabalash and thing like that. Red of us, other rest of people calling in. We'll see. They think so we crack it because we crack your teeth. So then half of when we the yeti that we didn't do that thing, and we changed and we started speaking this way, you would think that people would stop saying we were backward, we were ignorant. No, they continued to say that instead of saying we were bilingual and that we were blessed. But the word Gullah means people blessed by God. And on our national flag for the Gullah Geechee Nation, you see circles. Those circles connect us. They hold us together. In the center of the circle is a tree, the tree that has the human bodies intertwined, inextricably tied together and rooted into this soil, this sand, where if you touch it, if your spirit is open and you walk this land, the power, the energy and the healing that our ancestors had, oh, comes back into you. If one of the one that I'll give our children too. And here it is that you have to be open to be healed. To enter that part of that circle, you have to be open to going into it. And the circle has to be open for you to enter. And so as I spoke with my sisters as I prayed for my sisters over this past year of this pandemic, and as many call it a pandemic, we saw injury and wounds being compounded by numerous factors. Most of all, stress. Stress about whether people would keep their jobs, whether they would literally live or die, whether they would get sick or not, whether they would be able to feed themselves and their families or not, whether they would be able to strive and survive. No doubt, our elder mothers had these same things that they dealt with over their 80, 90, 100 years that many of them lived to be here in the Gullah Geechee Nation. No doubt, they've seen horrific things. And you know what they always would say to us? This too shall pass. This too shall pass. Now, everything in life is about the passing minutes, the passing hours, and what we do with them. Everything's about that. Everything is about the choices we make. I place before you life and death, blessings and cursings choose life. When we choose life, what quality of life do we have? 
what do we do if our quality of life is lacking? We still have a choice to try to fight, to work, to pray, to meditate, to do all we can to make it better. Yes, we can pray, but you got to work too. Faith without works is dead. So I want to bring together two of my sisters who I know know this because they lived through this. They are living through this. They are examples of how you heal when you're the Gullah Geechee and thing like that and other rest of people are cracking teeth and say, honey, cracking and thing like that and call all, all kind of thing. Because being called Geechee over the years has not been considered positive or powerful. It has been considered backward and ignorant. And people did their utmost best to annihilate us. But God had another plan. Again, Gullah is people blessed by God and Geechee comes from the Gullah here. So you can't do anything but birth blessings for multiple generations. But those generations behind could throw away their blessings if they don't realize that's what they are. If they don't know the difference between the blessing and the cursing, if they don't know that it's not about blame, it's about choice. What the children must know you must teach them. So I thought it not robbery that we spend some time this earth month grounding ourselves in healing places and healing spaces. And who better than to bring somebody in that works in the national parks? And y'all have heard Frank and Audrey Peterman on this show before. And if you haven't seen that yet, go to gullagichi.tv gullahgeechee.tv, G-U-L-L-A-H is Gullah. Geechee is G-E-E-C-H-E-E, -E -E. ain't a no I and Geechee for the we. Go to gullahgeechee.tv and watch the episode about the healing in the great outdoors. But I know some of y'all said, well, that was a good episode, but you know, I don't have a lot of outdoor space around me. Well, there's probably some spaces you don't realize are there. And that you can create a healing space, even in your apartment, with an altar, a shrine, with good music, with candles, burning sage. But you got to choose to have that be a healing space in a healing place. So my sister Robin White has taken a journey through the National Park Service up the ranks. But her real journey is the one we want to share today. So peace and blessings, Sister Robin. How honey to do? What going on with honey did right now and thing like that? Let the people see you so we can see who honey be and what going on in honey journey. And while Sister Robin comes on as well, I want to introduce my sister who is part of the Wilmington North Kakalaki family, Sister Sufia Giza. Some of you who've come to the Gullah Geechee Nation International Music and Movement Festival have seen her present there some of her poetry. And my people down there in Tobago, yeah, and they see the same one will come, laugh we plenty time and come there and spend month and month on Hona Islands and thing. And we can't hardly get you back to the Aunt Sea Islands because she always did over there. So Sister Sufia, we're so glad to welcome you with Zooming in fun sustainability as well. And Sister Robin, I'm gonna start off talking to you as Sister Sufia comes on screen as well. And you have this book that I think has the most beautiful title of some of the books that are now in my library, Beauty in My Bones. Because more often than not, we hear bones, we start thinking scary stuff, you know, if we start, cause you don't normally see folks bones. But what made you decide that after all these years on your journey to scribe it and to name it Beauty in My Bones? Because I know from the day that I met you, I've had some beauty in my bones just on the beautiful moments that we've had the opportunities to spend together taking a journey as Geechees. What going on, sis? This has been a 20 year journey in writing and scribing and sharing my narratives. But you know, as you were growing up and people called you, you know, the thing, come back, you come here, you little old nappy headed Geechee girl. You hear mm -hmm. that, or your back wall of Geechee. And you growing up in an environment where you were ashamed of being who you are, 
and you mm-hmm. lose that part of you that that actually is your salvation and people are constantly trying to disconnect you from who you are and you mm-hmm. have to hold on to it and fight to hold on to it and then growing up in um my yaya went to the hospital for heart surgery and during that she had an aneurysm i was 11. she never mm-hmm. came home and so I was raised in an environment um, where there was a lot of abuse. And mm-hmm. even my sister was calling me ugly and African witch, African bee. And you know, you're gonna be an alcoholic. You're gonna have a bunch of babies. You're gonna have welfare. You're gonna be a welfare queen. queen. You're gonna be a drug addict. And I had to keep um, validating myself and saying, I'm not going to be that. I'm not mm-hmm. going to be that. Every time she tell me mm-hmm. I was gonna be this, I decided, I knew what I was not going to be, but I have right. yet to learn what, what I am going to be. Want to be. That's right. That mm-hmm. was my journey in coming unto myself and coming into the National Park Service, going from being raised, I was that suitcase kid from house to house, from state to state, from city to city, and mm-hmm. a migrant worker at age 14 in Umatilla, Florida. I had to decide early on what I was going to do. My mm-hmm. elders that had their hands on me never said, baby, you got to go to school. Baby, you got to get an education. But mm-hmm. for some reason, I knew after they educated me universally, I knew that was my next step. And mm-hmm. the book is my journey and learning who I am, tripping, falling, and keep getting up is really about I've been faith in myself and I have to continue validating myself, but I'm also validating the women clan of my family because yes. I'm from a complex family and they yes. have hands on me. Um, mm. And I stayed in there that some of them had a pocket full of crazy, but well, we all got a pocket <laughs> full of crazy. So, right. <laughs> you know, That's right. You know, and you know, we are all dysfunctional to certain degrees and discovering Mm. and believing in yourself has been my journey Um, since age 11. I would say I'm an orphan at age 11. And for 40 years, 50 years, I'm continuing trying to find myself. Mm -hmm. And this Mm -hmm. was the beginning of my coming onto terms with who I am. Yeah. And you know, it's powerful because this section that I read was what really, really struck me right out the gate. My family is female dominated. We are an extension of eight generations. I dutifully noted our ancestries as we are born from wounded wombs, the origins of our generational trauma. But even so, we are not junk. (laughs) Now, yeah, wounded wombs. I mean, that was like, boom, like, whoa, you know, because the womb is where the child gestates so to already know it's wounded it's like well how does the child even manage to make it out you see and then though the end part we're not junk and I think that so many people don't get to that point like they would have got stuck right there on the wounded word and never get out the womb to recognize there's some growth here you're not junk you're not junk and so it's so powerful because that's why I wanted Sister Sufia to be here, because that's where these young folks are right now, that a lot have also come from wounded wounds, but don't have that kind of language to express it so eloquently, to say that's what it is. And she's in the process of creating what truly is a sanctuary for young folks to come to, to be able to do what you've done, Sister Robin, is to navigate that space and to heal from the wounds. And so, Sister Sufia, peace and blessings, sis. It is so good to have Hona Raicha in this healing circle. And the Yeti, but this oasis that Hona about to build Raicha at home in the Gullah Geechee Nation. Tell the folks a little bit about who Hona be and tell them about your new project and this fundraising effort to create this kind of space for healing a lot of folks who were birthed out of wounded wombs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all I want to do. 
Um, I am Gullah Geechee, um, and what Sister Robin said, it just resonated so much in my heart, because I too came from a wounded womb and had to walk through the battlefield um, most of my early life. I wasn't in foster care, but I actually left home as a runaway at 15 and ended up through the help of an advisor going to college, majored in counseling, majored in bilingual education. And so I went to work as a social worker and I was working with those youth that were in foster care and in group homes. And, you know, we would take them from a home and they would end up even worse sometimes in the system. Wow. And so that always resonated with me. And on my job, I was on my way to an appointment one day and had a car accident. And I totaled my car, messed up my back, and ended up in physical therapy. And my first week in treatment, I was assaulted by the physical therapist. So it was trauma on top of trauma. And I had to, you know, learn how to walk again. I started getting into African culture a lot deeper got into all kind of healing methods, acupuncture, chiropractics, herbs, yoga, meditation. And it was that that saved my life. Mm -hmm. And from that point, I just made a choice that it was always going to be about living my life to the fullest mm -hmm. and still being able to give back. And so here I am full circle. And the goal of Tranquil Oasis Youth yeah. Apprenticeship Program is to work with at-risk youth who are aging out of foster care because too often when the door get closed and there's no funds for them they end up homeless they have no skills often don't go to college and so my goal is to bring in people you know professionals who can teach them building trade and agriculture so that they can have life skills and, and so that's, that's what we're working on right now, moving forward. And uh, the land is in Wasamasa, which is about 30 minutes out of Charleston in the low country. And um, we're just continuing to do the work. We're doing outreach, looking for youth now. We have a, a builder on board. I've got a couple agricultural experts. Uh, recently went to a black farmers conference here in South Carolina and got a lot of tools that I could use with the youth. So, yes. Yeah. We may come from wounded wombs, but we still have a lot to offer. We are not junk. That's right. That's Thank right. you for those words. Right. Yeah, it's powerful. And and when you say life skills, that leads me to another section here in Robin's book, because this is something people don't realize is a life skill and things are conditioned behavior. They're learned behavior, but we operate out of conditioned behavior. So whether we are used to fighting all the time because that's what we're conditioned to do, or we're used to drinking all the time is because we're conditioned to do it. You know, there's a lot of those things and, and people don't look at the conditions you grow up in and how you're living out of those conditions, even if it's 50, 60 years later, you know, but this is, this is a condition too. Because they tell me if it takes 21 days to start a habit, it can take 21 days to break a habit. Exactly. So listen to this, y'all. Listen to this. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta really feel this now. It said, you are remarkable. I'm gonna pause right there. You are remarkable and deserve to know the value of love, not the fictional fairy tales but the weight of true raw love in all its pain and glory. Live in the now, lean into the new, and stand in your shine to love unconditionally. Now, to love unconditionally, stand in your shine. Now, see, see, Robin, you should have never go on there for me. You should have never go on there because see what you said, that shine, you know that's it for me because you know I'm always letting it be clear that we be Gullah Geechee anointed people and we are black gold. So you know that when you put that in there, but that shine, that was it for me. That was it. So now you tell folks, lean into the new. Now, you know, there was that song just a while back that said, lean back, 
lean back, lean back. You know, right? Everybody want to lean back, but we got to move forward. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So, so tell us, how did you make this love that you were speaking of, this raw love, how did you make that part of your habit? Like, instead of it being what your sister was trying to speak into your existence, you rebuked that and spoke into your existence what you would have not what you wouldn't have. How did you speak that raw love into your existence? And when you say lean into it, how did you start learning to lean in instead of lean back? I, I'm, I'm learning me and I'm still learning me. But growing up, I was maybe 17. I was um, emancipated from Indiana Girls School out of Indianapolis, Indiana. And I meet this young man four years older than me and we get into a relationship. Um, he taught me about conditional love. And in the book, I talk about conditional love and unconditional love. And I state that unconditional love becomes conditional when someone, when the rhythm changes and someone is not treating you properly as you deserve to be treated like a queen. And when they are abusing you, then it becomes conditional when you say, you have to do this or else. And you're learning yourself through that process that I'm not going to take this. And so mm -hmm. it becomes conditional. But this young man told me in the very beginning of our relationship, that I'm not going to always love you. Our relationship is going to change. And if mm -hmm. that happens, I don't want you to let me mistreat you. He mm -hmm. said, I love you now enough to tell you that years from now, if I began to mistreat you, you must leave me. That's you deep. must leave me. You, I, this is what he said to me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make a fool of you and I love you now. And I don't want anyone else to make a fool of you in the future. That's this deep. was my first lesson of love from mm -hmm. someone that I'm meeting and we're just emerging. And so this emotional integration that's going on was very dynamic because I'm green, I'm young, I'm just coming out of girls' school, I'm learning myself, and he's teaching me about this beauty, but he's also teaching me to stand in my shine. It's come on and lean into it, mm -hmm. but recognize when there's a mishap, recognize that yeah. and do not stay in that. That's mm -hmm. what he taught me. And here yeah. I am today. When that moment came, this man said, you still here? And mm -hmm. I shake the locks the next day. Because that, that was a signal for me to move on and move not on. Him continue to hurt me. That's, That's deep. That's deep. Because I see that in your book, there's a section, there's a chapter called Breakthrough. So that sounds like that breakthrough, but what I find so critical, you know me, I'm analytical. Yes, um, so, very. Yes, I'm very analytical. <laughs> so you've been on me a long time, you know that. So my thing was, I looked at what you put before the breakthrough and before the breakthrough was a hankering and the hankering said, comforting sheets provide refuge, astounding inaudible cries, breaking boundaries, lips part to emancipate what's inside, a breakthrough for real liberation, cautioning a sensation beyond recreation. Of course, things are different now. And I guess that difference was you breaking out of there, like you said, breaking out of the cycle of abuse, breaking out of that situation and leaning into the new. Is that what it was? And coming unto myself, each step, I have to become stronger and stronger. Each step, I have to accept me and learn the value and the art of self-validation because there's so much chaos around you. So many people's tongues are wagging and you can't pay attention to all of that chaos. Mm -hmm. Learning yourself, leaning into it, and you don't have to carry any of that with you. You right. can't carry that with you. You have to stand and not let it weigh you down. Right, right, right. So that brings me back to Sister Sufia. Naming your place, Tranquil Oasis, where we are already on the coast. 
we are surrounded by water. Water is everywhere almost that we look. Um, and to think about that, being someone who's traveled to all 50 states, I think the only other person probably robbing them worked in all 50. I just traveled to all 50, right? Um, and here it is, when you think of oasis, the first thing you think desert, and then you think illusion, because is it real or isn't it? So what would make you use the word oasis in the midst of the Gullah Geechee Nation you know, and because it is already tranquil, so we know why you said that. But <laughs> why Oasis? What what was the motivation for that? Was that something you were leaning into? Yeah, um, although I'm Gullah Geechee, I grew up in Southern California, not far from the desert. Uh -huh. And our land in Wasamasaw is on Calamus Pond Road and it's right near the Wasamasaw Swamp. So I just wanted to give a different feel for, you know, swamp land, you know, mm -hmm. swamp land can also be an oasis and, you know, we have to get back to the land. And so the environment is, is crucial to me. Um, mm -hmm. And so it just um, felt right, you know, mm -hmm. when those two came together and I wanted to be, as you say, a sanctuary, you know, and so to me, an oasis in the desert is a sanctuary. And I just had that whole vibe of it being tranquil because that's been my goal. Like what Sister Robin was saying, I had something written here because I had some notes to prepare for today. And one of them is choose you. There you go. And it's like F them, but the F is forget them all, you right. know? So in order to choose you, sometimes you have to love people from a distance absolutely and so when i started charting my path and i got into vegetarianism i would drive from la home to visit my mom I'd take my pots and pans because i didn't want no cross contamination and i'd be cooking or she'd be cooking some black eyed peas with some pigtails or something in it and she's like Chad, you grew up on this and i'm like you know, she's like, you was raised on this. And I'm like, yeah, the definitive word is was. Was. Because now I'm charting a new path. And so the vegetarianism, the yoga, the meditation, it gave me a grounding, you know, that I needed. And, and so I want to give that grounding back to these youth that are at risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the Oasis, when people come to this space, if youth come to this space, they will start to learn these same tools then. You're going to give them opportunities to learn how to just breathe it in. Exactly. Size, I say, yes. And, and meditate. touch it. And touch it. I was going to say that. Environment. Yes. Get your hands in the dirt. I got a garden, you know. Uh, yes. And I hadn't planted a garden in years, but I started one last year. And so I got another one going. These are the skills my mom taught me. We always had a garden every year. You know, yeah. my mom was from St. Stephen. So even though I grew up in California, I had to get you mama. And it all. You know? <laughs> and so I'm trying to give back those types of skills. I'm a certified yoga instructor. During the pandemic, I wrote a cookbook, Vegan Soul Food, Food for the oh, Soul. You oh, know? Yeah. And, and just giving it all back, basically. Excellent. So, Robin, it's interesting because to come in today to do this show, I came in from my field. <laughs> I got about an acre out there that I planted and I'm doing this row by row little irrigation because it wasn't enough rain. So literally I move my little irrigation thing please by piece and it gives me my other exercise because I also do yoga but don't usually have time. Got so much stuff stacked up all over the place in the archive, don't have floor space. So it's like, so I say I get my, get my stretches in still before I go out there that get my, you know, bends and all that. I do intentional types of moves while I'm out there in the field. And so Robin, having worked as a migrant worker though, mm. how do you feel when you hear about agriculture and going into the field and touching the land? Because I've had so many people that have misconstrued 
the real legacy of touching the land and feeding ourselves from it and being self-sufficient from it because they associate it with the trauma of slavery. They associate touching the land and farming with our ancestors being in bondage to do so. And with you being a person who is a migrant worker, we know many times the treatments of migrant workers, even now, is akin to parallels. It, the only difference is they might get less than minimum wage, a few dollars versus our ancestors got no cash for it. But it's still a lot of harsh conditions. It's not like a comfortable life. And then you move around, like you said, a suitcase kid. For you now, having leaned into this discovery of who you are, find your own oasis everywhere that you have journeyed to. How do you feel about touching the land now? especially if it has to do with going in a field and harvesting things. Well, even then we were, and we are a people of the land. We are, we come from that, our ancestors come from that. And I tell the people that we are not victims, we are survivors. I'm not right. a victim, I am a, a survivor and I live on purpose. Not right. for purpose, but I live on purpose in I have no intentions for my purpose or potential to be in a cemetery. So I live for each day. And I was 14 as a migrant worker. You would tell a foot on Golden Gems Camp. That's that was the place. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, we were picking oranges and grapefruits, and each crate was like five or seven dollars um, for each crate. But I'll pick pecans, I'll pick cotton. My parents at one point were sharecroppers and um, on Max Shan Plantation. My oldest sister was the product of a violation of my mom for one of them. Um, so that's where we come from. When my older sister crossed over, there was no record of her because she was born by a midwife. And so mm -hmm. we lost that Bible moving from place to place. But at the mm -hmm. same time, um, I've always gone back to places that where we come from. I didn't run from it. I ran to it because I needed to understand myself. I needed mm -hmm. to forgive um, my family because mm -hmm. the bulk of my aunts and uncles, my grandyaya, my father, they all lived in the bottom. They all were alcoholics. I needed mm -hmm. to understand why. And mm -hmm. going back, learning, whereas my grandyaya had to be my cousins, three of them, three of the boys, she had to beat them as ordered by the master um, on this plantation. In the summertime, we were sent to that plantation. And so I had to understand who I am, where I come from, and understand that this is a part of who we are and take what the best of it that we can take out of it and not mm -hmm. be that victim and be a survivor and passing right. it on and teaching that to the next generation because mm -hmm. we have to prepare them to sit at the table. And how do we do that is passing on what our knowledge to them and preparing them for to make decisions at that table. Mm -hmm. And it's so wonderful that you mentioned that, that you said you didn't run from it, you ran to it. Because, you know, nowadays, uh, one of my good friends said the other night, you know, if you don't put every kind of bell and whistle on it and all that kind of stuff, you know, this generation don't want to run to it. And like you're saying, if you want to live your culture, if you want to lean into who want to be, there are things that you have to run back to. And that means the land. That means being able to be part of the circle, the healing spaces, the healing places, not continuing to say, well, oh, well, I heard, you know, this was some place that was traumatic, but not realize the beauty in a place and again in that space. And so when we talk about your book being beauty in my bones, you know, I think of it was like fire shut up in my bones, you know. So what was the fire? What is the passion? that made you come back to these places in these spaces where you could have just ran with the suitcase and just kept going like some people and then even try to deny that background 
what what you what do you feel was really that passion shut up in your bones? I was drawn to it. As a girl child, I would get visitors and I had to understand um, why people were visiting me. I would get, you know, so I would talk to my yaya um, before she left, but then as I'm being raised by elders from place to place, they are also sharing universal knowledge with me. They are teaching me unbeknownst to me. They're sharing things with me that become a reality later on in my life. Whereas I was chosen to do certain things. Um, people visit me for certain reasons and mm -hmm. to help them or bringing me messages, but I'm right. always safe. I, I, right. I should not be alive today. I should not be alive today. That's why I said mm -hmm. I live on purpose because as a child from the age of 11 to 14, I was out there and anything could have happened to me. And yet I was blessed with all these women and having their hands on me and directing me from circle to circle, from place to place, teaching me how to make oils, teaching me about the environment, learning how to cook certain things. I cook everything from scratch, everything. Mm -hmm. My family laugh at me now because everything is fast food, right? So they make fun of me um, because that is my nature. That's part of my DNA, mm -hmm. no spices. And it was these women that prepared me for that that universal love. And then I went on to further my education with society, what they have to teach us. But mm -hmm. in our circle, in our culture, they taught me things. And then I went on to get my bachelor's in criminal justice. I got my master's in politics, leadership, and social issues. But mm -hmm. my first education was community. My first education to become a lover of the land. My first education was to dip into my culture and not deny um, and learn, unlearn. I'm gonna say unlearn the shame that was put up on me. So I had to unlearn that to learn how to love, how to learn to love myself, how to mm -hmm. learn to love the people around me. But first, I think their first lessons with me was teaching me to unlearn what had put in me, what had been put in me. And there was a lot of mess, okay? <laughs> it was oh, a lot of mess. Yeah. I hear that, I hear that. And this is this is so, so interesting to me um, because here it is that there's just a part that really I want Sister Sufia to respond to out of Robin's book once again. It says, the truth flows through our veins and it is our reign that will bring down the thunder because we are the people of a mighty nation. We are beautiful and strong. Remember, there's beauty in our bones. When people come to this tranquil oasis, how will you help them to find that truth that flows in their veins so that they realize that they are people of a mighty nation, like Sister Robin has so eloquently described here? Well, uh, the one thing I would do is pass on the same wisdom that elders passed on to me, as Sister Robin said. My grandmother came to live with us, and my mom had never told us we were Gullah Geechee. She had so much trauma in schools. You know, she was left-handed and, you know, they tried to beat her from right and left-handed and they would stop her from talking Gullah Geechee. But when my grandmama came, that's the only tongue she spoke. So mm -hmm. I started picking it up. She mm -hmm. taught me things that nobody else was taught. I mean, I could still make my grandmama's biscuits, right. you know. And so when I got a little older, I just gravitated to the African culture and I would go and sit at the feet of scholars like Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark and you know, Renoko Rashidi and take notes. I had an opportunity to engage them. And mm -hmm. all of that got logged in here. And mm -hmm. going through those traumatic years that I went through and working on healing myself and getting into holistic health, all of those things I want to make available to the youth. And the one thing I want to stress is mental self-care. Yes. Because 
There's so much intergenerational trauma from one generation to the next, and it just keeps getting passed on and passed Absolutely. on. And we got to yeah. break the cycles. Absolutely. So Tranquil Oasis is going to, you know, prayerfully be that cycle breaker. And I'm going to yeah. work toward giving them the tools that they can use when they have to deal with anger management, teach them how to meditate or yo do yoga or, or different herbs that you can smell, aromatherapy, you know, jasmine to calm them down or lavender, you know, something that is going to be right there in front of them, you know, yeah. and teach them that, you know, all vegetables, all produce does not come from the store. You know, right. it does not basic. grow in a plastic bag or in a box. Exactly. Right. I've been teaching that for years. Just some yeah. basic, basic life skills. And yeah. so, yeah, that, that's the goal of Tranquil Oasis is to be able to give them some tools they can use. Absolutely. So would you tell everyone how can they donate? How can they contribute to make sure that Tranquil Oasis truly becomes this space that you have envisioned? Thank you. Thank you for that. We have a GoFundMe campaign. It's called Tranquil Oasis Youth Apprenticeship Program. And you can give $5 or 50 cents or $500. We've had some generous donors. Our goal is 500 and we're about halfway there. Uh, we just started the campaign last month, I believe it was, or late February. And our goal is to be up and running by July. And, uh, yeah, so I got almost two acres there in Wasmasaw, beautiful timberland, and we're going to clear a couple acres of the timber. My family has another seven acres in the back. And so um, we've had the land since 1898. And when I look at all those old census from 1910 and beyond, uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, they were all listed as farmers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, so and it's okay. on a legacy. exactly, on a legacy. yeah, and proudly to do that, you yes. know, I feel it's my calling, and, and so I want to give these same tools, you know, as I said, my mother had us in the garden every year, and so for the last two years, I've got my own garden. I still got okra that I canned from last year. I got some in the freezer. Same thing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yes. Yes. And the beauty of it is 1898, where with your family roots, also part of your family roots stemming from Wilmington, North Carolina, the power of 1898 to know that people were running for their lives, literally in 1898, yeah. running into the marsh to try to find a place of sanctuary, to find an oasis, to find a place of peace after getting run out of the city of Wilmington, simply because they were self-sufficient to then have your family begin truly their self-sufficiency by having this land. And now you passing that on as well to the youth. So if people can go to GoFundMe and look for Tranquil Oasis, but how else can they get in touch with you? Because you mentioned your book, you mentioned your cookbook, and I know you have your poetry out there. So how can people get in touch if they want to also obtain those things? Okay. The land in Wasamasaw, We've had the deed since 1898, but that land has been in our family for generations. Oh, my yes. first book is called Mound Builders of Ancient America, A Legacy Reclaimed. You can find it at moundbuilderswinclan.com. In it, I trace back eight generations to Mississippian mound builders. And our, a part of our Gullah Geechee heritage is also Muscogee Creek. And so last week I connected with my Wasamasaw family and in 20 minutes on the phone, I learned more about that land on Columbus Palm Road. There's an indigenous uh, cemetery on the road. It is a historical Native American area. And so I didn't grow up knowing this. You know, it, it's been my research and a DNA test in 2017 that took me to this part of my history. And now I can go back 11 generations. And so I'm also doing genealogy work with young people and elders as well. And all that information is there on the moundbuilderswinclan.com site. Okay, excellent, excellent. So definitely y'all make sure you go ahead 
get the books, make sure you make a donation. Does it don't say stuff like, oh, you know, if I've been, oh, if I had something I could give, you do not have to give the full amount that's on the GoFundMe. Like it said, put five on it. Y'all know that I got five <laughs> on it. Y'all know that. So y'all can put that five on it. Okay, don't give us that stuff of what y'all can't do. You can do this, okay? And we're going to make this happen, and then we all go gather in the Oasis. Yeah, go ahead, Sister Sophia. And I was also saying, or, or, or thinking, <laughs> to say, um, even sweat equity, you know, once we get up, um, I, I would love Sister Robin to come and speak to these youth. You know, I have another elder sister in Atlanta who used to work with foster care youth who's also willing to come so it doesn't necessarily have to be money it could be a donation in the spirit bank it could be some time volunteering or a prayer even you know so yeah and and I, again i thank you so much queen quet for this opportunity to engage the family community Yes, I appreciate you so much. And I just had to have you on here because when we're talking about sustainability, we got to sustain ourselves first. In order to sustain the land, we have to sustain our sanity first. And the land does help us to do that, believe it or not. And so definitely when Sister Robin said beauty in my bones and right now i'm fighting graveyard desecration we often think about the bones that are there beneath the soil but we don't think about the bones that our souls are in and the beauty that's there so sister robin please let the folks know how they can get this outstanding book beauty in my bones please unmute let the people know um, how they can obtain this book. And also, you know, Sister Sufia want to bring you into the Oasis to speak, but are you going around speaking and engaging with people and doing any signings right now of your book? We would love to know. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me also state that this book has been a mental hygiene for me and just purging. It has been a mental hygiene. And one of the things I want to say um, to my sisters is that we have um, the capacity to move beyond space occupants apology. We no longer have to apologize for who we are, how we look, how we sound, how we walk, Ooh. our skin color. So no right. more apologizing for the space that we occupy because we own that space. Right. And the book, um, you can order it on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Um, Beauty in My Bones, Robin White. Um, you can order it from there. Wonderful. And this has been an awesome journey. And Queen, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. It is truly a blessing to have my sisters here and to just have this opportunity to sit in the circle of healing, even though we're doing it virtually. Uh, God <laughs> willing, truly soon. Um, Chilla to sit right here with me one more again. But say, tell that thing I got that air red once we going on up the creek yonder and then go to Sufia and sit there and eat the oak tree and thing like that and have some sweet tea and crack we tea for who we be and the beauty that did all of we because we know who we be, that we be Gullah Geechee anointed people. And so I must say, thank you, thank you to my sisters. Thank you, thank you to all the viewers. We're so glad that Hunter Chillin taught them not robbery for tuning in one more again with we for zooming in upon sustainability. Hunter Chillin, if you ain't know who I be, I the queen quit, head upon the body of the Gullah Geechee Nation. Make sure for follow, we Gullah Geechee TV station, if Hunter wants to share this with some sisters, with your family, with the circles out there. So the healing can expand, the circle can get broader. Make sure to follow Gullah Geechee.tv. Gullah Geechee.tv, member G-E-E-C-H-E-E, and -E -E no I and Geechee for the we, cause this is all about we and we healing the family on this year journey. This has been such a blessed day, this healing circle, this opportunity to connect right here where we be. Wherever you are, please take the time out and make your place a healing space. Continue this journey with us. Learn more about how you can support Tranquil Oasis, how you can obtain the books. You can obtain my books at gullahgeechee.biz, gullahgeechee.biz. You can also support the journey for healing for all of we, y'all in the Gullah Geechee Nation. 
become a part of the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition at gullahgeechee.net, gullahgeechee.net. Once again, Gullah is G-U-L-L-A-H, Geechee is G-E-E-C-H-E-E. -E. Ain't there no I in Geechee if it a we. Follow we at Gullah Geechee on Twitter, at Gullah Geechee on Instagram, and continue to support this journey of us healing ourselves by standing on this space, this land where our ancestors too had the opportunity to stand. Support the Gullah Geechee Land and Legacy Fund and GoFundMe. And you can also send over donations via Cash App to dollar sign Gullah Geechee Nation, dollar sign Gullah Geechee Nation. If you want to look for me and yet even who I be, you can go to queenquet.com, queenquet.com. But please continue to follow our blog at gullahgeechination.com and follow Gullah Geechee Nation on Facebook because we got a lot more that's coming in, that's coming to you to broaden the circle of healing and sustainability throughout our global community. So wherever Hunter be, peace, love, and blessings on Hunter journey. So glad you tune in for Yeti this year for all of we are zooming in on sustainability.